Yeah, yeah, let's get started. Um, to open the summit, uh, we're going to welcome onto the stage the Vice President for Engineering uh, for Chrome. It's uh, a warm welcome to Linus Upson, everyone. Thanks. Wow, a lot of people here. Um, so not surprisingly, I'm here to talk about the web and what we're doing about it in Chrome. Let's figure out which button to push. That looks good. How many people here recognize this? Oh, wow, there's a lot of old people here. Um, so those of us old folks will remember in the very early days of the web, there was this thing called the NCSA What's New page. NCSA was where Mosaic was developed, the first really popular web browser. And um, back in those days, the way you found things on the web is um, you went here. And it had a list of all the sites on the web. And so when you stood up a new website, you sent them an email saying, hey, I've got a new website. Uh, could you please link to me on the What's New page? And they'd go do that and have a link to your website there. And you can see here in, uh, was it June 27, 1993, we had one, two, three, four, five websites launched that day. Nothing on the 26th. It was probably a Sunday. Um, <laughs> needless to say, um, this, this didn't scale. So then the next popular way for finding things was directories. Yahoo was the most successful of them. And many conferences were held about how the web should be organized. People talked about ontologies, and they came up with ways to categorize everything on the web. And when we wanted to find something, you'd go to Yahoo or one of these other directories and click on games or entertainment, and eventually you'd find you know, a group of websites that you could, you could look down and pick which one you wanted or, or try a few of them to see if, uh, if that's what you were looking for. And Yahoo, uh, at the peak of popularity, had about three quarters of a million sites in their directory. And I think they peaked at about a million and a half sites. Um, so needless to say, this approach didn't scale for the web either. Then came search engines, um, Google being one of the more successful ones. Uh, the, the really clever thing that Larry and Sergey did at the very beginning of Google was they figured out that um, just the text on the web pages told you a lot about the web. But the links between those pages were also really important. And in fact, this chaotic structure of the web with everyone linking to everyone else um, actually told you a lot about what was important and what wasn't so that you could deliver really great search results for people. And so far, this is still scaled with the web. And, uh, and when you think about it, it's pretty amazing because there are billions and billions of web pages out there. Um, hundreds of millions coming and going every day, uh, billions of users. And uh, for many of us, on any given day, we'll consume tens, if not hundreds, of different sources of information, content, services, applications, communicate with people, all just by doing a search and clicking on a link. And so uh, we've been thinking a lot on the Chrome team about what has made the web successful and uh, what are the areas that it really needs to improve. And so first, let's talk about what's made the web really successful. And this first thing is the, the HT of HTML. Everything is a link. So uh, you can get to anywhere on the web by typing in a URL, clicking on a link. These links can be spoken to people of just try a domain name. They can be written down on napkins. They can be emailed, IM'd. Uh, and, and so they spread very freely, and it makes it really easy to try something, because all I have to do is click on a link to do it. The other important part of that is it's, it's also ephemeral. In other words, there should be no side effects to clicking on links. You know, I don't have to install software. I don't have to update software. Um, I can just run any piece of software, untrusted third-party code, by clicking on a link. And then when I go away, my browser may end up caching it for a period of time or something like that, but I, as a user, don't have to worry about that. The next thing is indexable. So uh, web pages show you all of their text by default. You don't necessarily have to write it that way, but the easiest way to write a web page makes it indexable. And so this allows search engines to appear. And even though search engines didn't really exist at the very beginning of the web, the fact that the web had this property allowed it to scale to this massive size with all of these different pages, and yet you can still find things. And you don't have to go manually organize them into directories and things like that. The next thing, composability, was not at the beginning of the web, but not long after that, iframes were invented. And it made it possible 
to take multiple sites and mash them up into one web page. And so this allowed you to do things like embed YouTube videos in a page, or put a map in a page, or, you know, very importantly for many publications, to be able to put an ad in a page. And the composability also had some very important properties that the, the page containing the other page uh, couldn't muck with what, what's inside it, and the thing inside of it couldn't muck with the, the outer containing page. And so this allowed it to very safely be able to aggregate content from lots of different places and make much richer applications than if you had to go get code and import it from someplace else onto your website. And that also brings me to the last point, which is safe. If you're going to run arbitrary code by clicking on links, it had better be safe. And so one of our most important jobs as browser vendors is to make it so that it's safe to click on links, that you shouldn't, it should be impossible for a bad guy to lure you to a site and then install malicious software on your computer or steal your credentials or do anything like that. And so, you know, this set of properties is what we think has really made the web successful. Because you saw from those early screenshots, the web was pretty ugly in the early days. Uh, everything was gray. I don't know, someday gray will be popular background page color again, but uh, probably not anytime soon. The, but even though the web was kind of slow, kind of ugly, the fact that it had these really nice properties caused it to just take off. And for the better part of 15 years or so, uh, most of the innovation that happened in the technology industry happened on the web because of all of these advantages it gave you. Then in 2007 came the iPhone, and shortly after that, Android and a number of other smartphone OSs, and they completely changed the game. Um, and they reset user expectations in a number of important ways, one of which is everyone now expects all user interfaces to have rock-solid 60 frames a second animations and transitions. This was not something the web was built to do. Uh, but now everyone expects this in all of your user interfaces. Uh, other things it did, it gave you uh, the ability to pre-cache a whole bunch of software and data when you installed an application so that it worked well in flaky networking environments. And if any of you remember the early generation iPhones or Android phones, everything was a very flaky network environment. Um, I can't remember when I got 3G and it was so excited. I saw the little 3G on there like, wow, this is fast. Now with an LTE phone, every time I see the 3G, I go, oh. But being able to, to cache all of your application code and resources up front made it work really well in these flaky network environments. Other things it did, it gave you access to a lot more I.O. capabilities. It gave you direct access to the GPU, gave you access to touch sensors, it gave you access to um, you know, raw network access, uh, device motion, location, GPS, a whole bunch of things to allow, allow developers to build more interesting applications and ones that, that were more suited to the mobile environment. And, and it, it also uh, allowed you to bring to bear a whole bunch of different development tools. Um, you weren't stuck programming in one language or one environment. Uh, even Apple, I don't know if you guys remember this, but a few years ago, they tried to make it so that everyone building apps for iPhone had to write in Objective-C. They tried to ban other languages, and developers rioted. And, and this, is, this is Apple. This is the Apple development community uh, more easily follows direction and, and, and is more homogenous than any other development community I've seen, and even they rioted. The game developers were like, we need Lua, and they're like, I need to write C++ GL games. And so, so even Apple had to back off there. So the importance of being able for developers to use whatever languages and tool sets and libraries they want to use to build their applications is also really important. So these are all the places where mobile applications excel, and these are all places where we really need to close that gap on the web so that you can do all of these things on the web so you retain all the advantages that web applications have that native applications lack. Um, but one of our goals on the Chrome team is to, to really close that gap. So the first thing on the list is rendering performance. So I mentioned before the expectations around mobile devices now are everything is 60 frames a second. And so you know, when the web was originally created, you know, people really weren't thinking about how to do rendering using GPUs, um, how to make it so that uh, you don't have stutters and frame rates. Um, and, and all of these kind of things. So there's a bunch of projects we have underway in Chrome to do this, uh, some of which involve new web standards, like web animations, uh, so that you can specify declaratively what animation or transition you want to have happen, and then 
uh, Chrome or the browser can then automatically make that happen for you so that you don't have to write code to handle every single frame of the animation. And that allows the system as a whole to schedule activity to maintain that frame rate so that you don't get glitches. Other things we're doing are things like reducing garbage collection pause time. So if you have to do work to produce a frame, you want to make sure that you can maintain that constant frame rate. It really sucks if you're trying to produce a frame and a GC comes and you go away for 60 milliseconds and you drop four frames. And so we're working very hard to both measure and improve uh, garbage collection and other VM latencies that exist. Because in complex VMs like V8, they do clever things like, oh, I notice you're running this function a lot. Let me optimize it for you. And even in the process of doing that, that could cause you to miss an animation frame. And so we're working very hard to make sure that that never happens. And there's a, there's a bunch of work underway to do that. And, and it's particularly tricky, both for garbage collection as well as compilation pauses and things like that, because even if you have multi-core, and we work hard to take advantage of all the different multi-core processors, your application might also be competing for cores. Or even if you're not competing for cores, very often you may be competing with the garbage collector or the compiler for memory bandwidth or cache pressure or things like that. So it's a very challenging problem. Uh, but we've made a lot of progress on that. So here's some examples of the improvements we've made. Um, so this was uh, one of our performance dashboards that tracks uh, JS Game Bench. And you see some changes were made that dramatically improved performance. Now, uh, we also look for performance regressions. And we have a lot of performance dashboards. If any of you have crawled around the Chromium site and tried to look at all of the performance dashboards, I think there are so many of them now that no human can keep track of them all. And in fact, about a year and a half ago, we had a massive regression on one of them. And nobody noticed, because it, uh, there were just too many for people to keep track of. And, and so that spurred uh, the team to think, like, how do we solve this problem? And so since the thing we know how to do is build software, we actually built software to watch all of the performance dashboards for us. <laughs> There's, they actually found this really cool anomaly detection framework that was developed elsewhere in Google and trained it to look at the performance dashboards, because as you know, sometimes there, it's hard to tell. Is it, is it slowly getting slower, or was there a uh, temporary regression? Was the, the bot just having a bad day? Um, and so uh, now we've got the system where you know, I get email alerts when performance regresses in, regresses in any of these areas. And we have a team of sheriffs that go and look at uh, the results from all of this and then go figure out what change caused the regression and go nag the developer who does that to you know, revert the change or make a fix so that we get the performance back. And so now, even though we continue to add capabilities to Chrome and the code keeps getting bigger, it's actually, in almost every area that we can measure, faster and uses less memory today than the day we launched five years ago because of this continual measurement of everything. Basically, for places we regress, they're usually in areas that we failed to measure. And then when we find them, we add a new measurement for it, and we work hard to never regress on them. Um, we're not perfect, but we're, we're getting better and better. Um, another area we've improved a lot is JavaScript performance. We've improved uh, on mobile about 50% in the last uh, year or so. And, uh, and this is an area that is, 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 of course, very important to us because most of the code that you run is all written in JavaScript, and so this goes directly to how fast your applications can be. Um, in addition, we launched a new version of the Octane benchmark. So Octane is the, the benchmark we use to tune V8 against. Because um, we basically try to put things in Octane that we think are important to make go fast, and then we work really hard to make it go fast. And in Octane 2.0, the changes we made there were primarily around uh, latency. For the first time, we have a JavaScript benchmark that actually measures latency. So that if you have long GC pauses or frequent GC pauses or things like that, you'll score poorly on the benchmark. Um, we also brought in a bunch of code from uh, uh, Inscripten. So basically, we have uh, a Zlib compiled down to JavaScript with Inscripten, you know, sort of using asm.js style JavaScript. And uh, include that in the benchmark as well. Now, we don't implement a special uh, compiler or anything like that, but we're just trying to make generic V8 work well on all kinds of JavaScript, even machine-generated JavaScript, like the stuff that comes out of Inscripten. Um, and, and then we also added um, some other large programs in there to really test uh, 
parse time, compilation time, and latency, and things like that. So large code bases of JavaScript, so that those things get benchmarked and tested as well. So uh, another area, we talked about working well on flaky networks and network performance. Uh, one of the things we've done to make the web more usable on mobile devices is we've introduced this mobile data compression proxy. And it gives you a 50% savings on the data transmitted. Uh, right now, uh, we're really focused mostly on saving data because a lot of people's usage of their mobile device is limited by paying for the bits that they get over the air. And so we're really focused on, on shipping fewer bits to them, but also there's opportunities to get performance improvements here as well. In addition to you know, building proxies, and one of the, the, the biggest things that the mobile data compression proxy does is it converts JPEGs to WebP images, which are about 25% smaller for the same quality level as JPEG. Um, but also by making that image format available on the web generally, uh, we've, uh, a lot of sites at Google have converted to using WebP if the browser supports it. Um, and uh, a number of sites at Google have seen latency reductions on the order of you know, 30 40% because a large portion of that page load time is just transferring data down to the user. So if you can transfer less data, you can make the web much faster. And the same is true on video. Going from VP8, which is about comparable to H.264 in terms of quality per bit, um, and moving to VP9, we're getting a 50% savings in the data rate. And so there's a number of properties at Google that are moving to use uh, VP9 inside of WebM uh, to transfer less data down to users. And this, of course, is particularly important on mobile devices. So some of you may know, um, uh, how many of you have met App Cache? How many of you have typed app cache into Google but not hit return to see what the suggestions are? <laughs> so service workers, an attempt to repent for those sins. Um, we want web applications to be able to work really, really well, even in flaky network connections or even when you're completely offline. And so we're putting a lot of effort into service worker to make that much easier to program and much more reliable to program in that kind of model. And we're also doing a lot to add uh, APIs to access all of the different hardware capabilities of both desktops, laptops, as well as mobile devices. Uh, we've already got parts of the device motion API in. Uh, we already have uh, location. Um, and and a, a bunch of additional things are, are underway. Um, three other big things have landed recently. We've got WebGL, uh, WebRTC. Um, and uh, web audio. And so this allows you to do much more interesting graphics on the web than you could do before. It allows you to do very interesting multimedia, both video and audio. And um, WebRTC in particular, I think, is really going to revolutionize communications. Because now you can really, when you think about it, web is really about communicating with people. And it, it's a shame that we've gone all this time without you actually being able to communicate with people. <laughs> Um, and, and WebRTC is going to enable this for the first time. It's, it's very cool. Um, I talked about some of the, the uh, APIs that have come in recently. Um, the other thing that mobile applications have gotten to take advantage of is uh, new UI toolkits and new UI paradigms. Um, so we're working on a number of things here to make it much easier to build really beautiful user interfaces and to make them work well in touch environments and in different screen sizes. So uh, one of the things uh, that's obvious about mobile is typing is a lot harder. And so we've recently introduced uh, something called Request Autocomplete. And what this does is it allows the browser to remember uh, a sets of information, the most important of which is payment. Because if you want to buy something on the web, having to type in credit card numbers, shipping address, mailing address, all of those kinds of things, um, it's a real pain. And so this allows you to do that once, either on a mobile device or on a desktop, and then Chrome syncs it across all the different platforms. And then when you want to go check out on a website, it can just call Request Autocomplete. It shows you a dialog with all of your information filled out and say, hey, do you want to send this to the website? You can look at it and say, yeah, that's great, and click OK. 
Um, if you need to change something, you can. You can select a different shipping address, for example, or select a different credit card. But for most cases, this really just brings really, really simple checkout flows to mobile devices. And there's a, some other things we have in the pipeline and along this line as well. Another big thing we're doing is Polymer. How many people here have heard of Polymer? OK. It's really exciting um, on two levels. One, um, and this may seem obvious, but in most programming environments, you can write a function in terms of other functions uh, with web components that Polymer is built on top of. For the first time on the web, you can actually write HTML tags in terms of other HTML tags and bundle the appropriate CSS and JavaScript with it and things as well. So you can build real first class components and have structured programming on the web and not just cut and paste programming. And so this is huge. And Polymer is a toolkit that was designed from the beginning to live on top of web components. And it brings both the structure of the application to make it much easier to, to build your app, as well as a user interface layer so that you can have uh, really beautiful 60 hertz animations and transitions. It knows what all the fast paths are in the browser and tries to stay on them. In fact, by definition, there's this constant feedback loop going between the Polymer team and the Blink team so that every time the Polymer team needs to make something fast, the Blink team goes and makes that fast. And so by using this toolkit, it's one of the easiest ways to stay on all of the fast paths inside of Chrome. And it's also got polyfills for all of the other modern browsers as well so that you can write your application once and deploy it across all the different browsers. So um, what else is this one? I forgot what's on this slide. Add to home screen. This is what? Add to home screen. Add to home screen, right. Um, so in the latest version of Chrome, uh, you can now be browsing around uh, in Chrome on Android. And you can take a web page and add it to the home screen of, your browser, uh, uh, of Android. So something really simple, um, but uh, makes it a lot easier for people to go, go back and get to websites again. Um, and of course, we're uh, working on making handling the, the uh, source set or uh, uh, what's the other one called? Set n? Source n. Source n, yes. Uh, so that you can handle multiple image resolutions as well as handling composition and, and uh, art direction and things like that, which is really important being able to work across lots of different screens. And, and also, very importantly, we care a lot about developer productivity. So we've invested a lot in Chrome's dev tools. How many people here have used them? Everyone? OK, so you're familiar with them. Um, so you know, if, if you can't uh, easily develop debug applications, you're not going to be very productive. And so we really want to make this, this better and better. So a lot of things have shipped recently. And uh, let me take a look here, see if I remember all of them. Um, We, we have, let's see, there's projecting, uh, there's remote debugging to mobile. Um, and I think there's also, um, uh, what was the other one? Screencasting? The layers panel. The layers panel, yes. And so, and in addition to that, there's a whole bunch of tools we've developed for debugging uh, GPU performance. Because it's very hard sometimes when you're writing something, you see a little screen stutter to figure out what happened. And being able to go into the developer tools and see a timeline and watch exactly like, ah, this bit of code was running right here, and that's why I dropped those frames. We also want to make it possible for people to use whatever languages or tools they want and still be able to deploy on the web. So, we want to make inscripting code run really fast so that you take C or C++ code and be able to deploy that on the web. Um, we want people to be able to write uh, more structured programs than you can in JavaScript with Dart. Uh, we want that to be able to run across all browsers. They, we just released Dart 1.0 a few days ago. And with Dart to JS, you can deploy it everywhere. There's even a number of cases where the Dart to JS will actually produce faster code than idiomatic JavaScript because, I mean, a lot of you here are very good JavaScript developers, but for many JavaScript developers, it's very easy to accidentally shoot yourself in the foot. And by having a more structured language compiled down to JavaScript, you can often get much better performance out of it for most programmers. Um, in addition, we have portable native client inside of Chrome so that we can run native code even faster than Inscripten or Asm.js style code. Uh, and 
But you can also take that code and run it in other browsers with pepper.js. So you can take all the pepper APIs and emulate them on other browsers. Uh, and as I said earlier, the V8 team is working very hard to take asm.js style code and make it run really, really fast in V8. Lastly, um, you know, I talked a lot about the advantages of the web of this linkability, ephemerality, uh, composability, uh, being safe and it being indexable. Um, and these are not things that you typically get with native mobile applications. Uh, but we realized that some people might want to be able to ship a native app, but use web technologies. So we've invested a lot in contributing to Cordova, which is the open source project behind PhoneGap, so that you can take what you've built on the web and package it up and deliver it as a mobile application. You don't get those core capabilities and advantages you get by being on the web, but at least it allows you to leverage the same technology stack for developing across different platforms, including the web. So lastly, um, you know, I, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. There's a lot of exciting talks uh, over the next couple of days. And so this is a great opportunity to connect not only with all the other developers here in the room, but with a lot of the, the Chrome developers uh, from Google. And we look forward to hearing back from a lot of you over the course of this conference. We'll be following along on G+. And so let us have it. Thanks. <laughs>